Boston. Yeah, no. I think we're good. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you for joining me. Um, my name is Dennis Norris II, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Open Source Gallery. I'm also a writer, and I co-host the podcast Food for Thought, spelled T-H-O-T. Um, and as part of our Artists at Home series um, for Open Source, we're conducting interviews with artists that we've worked with in the past. So I'm here with Nicholas Galanin, um, who had an incredible show with us last spring. So I'm going to ask Nicholas some questions. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's great to meet you digitally. <laughs> yes, digitally, um, given the world that we're living in. So I just wanted to start with some basically like checking in on you. We're kind of checking in on all of our artists. I want to know like, um, what are you working on currently? If you're able to work, like how is all that going? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's going well. Like, um, there's been so many cancellations across the board like, from these last few months. It's been uh, really interesting times for that, you know. <clears throat> as far as travel, I live in an isolated community of 8,000 people on an island. You got to fly or take a boat to get here. So a lot of my work is um, engaging with the world, which means traveling to places so the last few months I think I've had over 20 like uh cancellations as far as air air travel um wow and, fl and flights and and that's just that that's just like ones that had been planned and booked uh, not including the future uh obligations etc so yeah yeah trying to, to figure out what that means for me um, I travel a lot and it's I'm embracing this time home you know it's mm -hmm. uh wh when I'm home I can get work done and be with my family and um uh, focus on health and all these other things you know that it's not always accessible or easy to do when you're on the road so um so yeah just try just doing a lot of work my house studio is the studio here is the house and then I've got a small studio space in town that's um for my jewelry and stuff so wow that's amazing um so it sounds like you do a lot of different kinds of um pieces of work i'm most familiar with the show that you had at open source last spring um yeah yeah so yeah, would you tell us multi multidisciplinary and, and um as far as material and conversations and work goes from music to performance and sculpture and you know, customary work. I'm preparing to carve a, um, a large, uh, customary dugout canoe for uh, my indigenous community, our community in Juneau, which is a city north of here. So that's going to be a really big undertaking. Um, oh man, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, the, is that the, the 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 open source work though that you mentioned was an installation piece that. Um, came to because open source uh reached out um for an exhibition so you know this work was realized based on support from the from um, the gallery and that was the first uh installation of this piece which is traveling now and i believe it i don't know where it's at right now so it, it it's gone on to a few different shows so or a few yeah. different venues so um can you tell us a little bit about that installation and a little bit about the project and like yeah. where it came from the 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 work is titled the value of sharpness when it falls um it's kind of an ongoing conversation from another uh series of porcelain arrows titled i dreamt i could fly mm -hmm. um i dreamt i can fly is a re reference to um well, a few things. One is our dreams of when we actually, many people probably have experienced these where you, you dream and you're flying and then you wake up uh, without the ability to literally fly through space. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I've, I've had those dreams as a uh, child and I still remember them as, you know, this incredible feeling. And um, it's a reference to uh, indigenous rights 
uh, and our continual fight for sovereignty um, mm -hmm. under uh, you know the rule of uh, settler government um, where we are provided um, set rules that are meant to be tools for us. So the arrows reference these tools, um, but the the arrows in this instance are created from porcelain, which um, defeat the purpose of um, having a uh, instrument or tool that can be utilized to care for your family for through hunting or subsistence, can be used to defend your um, community when when you're um, when violence is brought your way or any 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 of these types of things. So um, these arrows shatter, and that's uh, um, that is a lot like the rules and tools that were given by government to uh, exist. Uh, a lot of times these these um, laws and rules are created foundationally to remove us. So they, mm -hmm. they're in that lineage of, of um, removing us and forcing assimilation, um, removing our uh, rights and access to land and family and language and, and spirituality, et cetera. So uh, that series is based on that conversation. Of course, the value of sharpness when it falls is similar. Again, they're hatchets. Um, there are also sharp instruments that are utilized as tools, whether it's for building fire or, again, um, for protection of some sort. Uh, but these hatchets, when they fall, they become valuable in this sentence because they're um, the sharp edges that uh, are created from them shattering become implements of our, our useful tools, um, highlighting indigenous resilience and our ability to continue that resilience based on um, these circumstances. So. Yeah, I think, um, I think that concept is really incredible and it's sort of, um, it's sort of both subtle and like not subtle the way that you choose to use porcelain um, because of its fragility, sort of representing yeah. the way in which all these structures are fragile. Um, and it's interesting because this conversation is really timely because I think right now everyone feels like the whole world is fragile and our society is fragile. And I feel yeah. like a lot of people, I mean, it's completely different circumstances, but I feel like a lot of people are being reminded um, that, you know, for all the power that we're supposed to stake in government, um, which is can be questionable anyway, um, that like it's all just made up. Like all of it is just people yeah. making things up and deciding that they're going to assign value or not to to it. Yeah. Um, so that's really that's really cool, and it's like I feel like that project is very um, in keeping with the ethos behind open source and like what open source is trying to do. Um, and I, I did get the chance to see the show last year and it was really um, beautiful. I also just love porcelain, which is kind of random. <laughs> but yeah. I just yeah, like that, love that, porcelain. That, that it was incredible in that space, particularly because the shadows and then also because of it really uh, filled the gallery in a really uh, dense way where you're walking through almost like you're, there's a danger of even knocking into the work or, you know, the, so you're you're aware of your um, your own space that you're keeping when you're in that in there amongst the suspended hatchets. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an interesting space. It's kind of a, a it feels a little bit dangerous when certain pieces of art are there, or certain installations are there, and um, it's one of the things I love about it the most. Um, yeah. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about your process when you're um, working on a project or when you're starting a new project? Sure, you know, there's, I have so many different um, modes of working through medium and engagement. So I, <clears throat> I don't have a um, set, like standard form of approaching. Uh, these things so a lot of times just trying to remain open-minded 
is, is a huge part of the process. Um, and with that, it means uh, observing and listening and engaging in those ways of just, you know, being able to, oftentimes it helps to visit or go to a space or place. So I recently had work um, installed at the Biennale of Sydney, which also was um, mm. moved to digital realms because of um, everything going on right now. But, um, and that was a new medium for me, it was earthworks and, and, and but it was a highly, it was guided by a lot of research and engagement. I was fortunate enough to be brought out to Australia um, mm. to meet with communities and um, engage with uh, Aboriginal artists and, um, you know, a lot of that I think is a big part of process as well. So um, I'm not oftentimes throwing myself into a, a community with my own perspective or idea if, if it's um, not necessary. That makes sense. It's, it's um, challenging ideas and perspectives and all of that, which is important to art. Yeah, and, and another, uh, for me, I, I feel like I, we, as an indigenous artist battle, um, I, I like stereotype um, through institutions and, and ec economics of culture and art. And, and um, the battle of that um, often means that people bring their own um, presumptions or, or their own ideas of authenticity to what we're capable or allowed to be or, or how we're allowed to express um, our perspectives and experiences. Uh, so I, you know, I try to lead by example and demonstrate uh, ways of doing that where it challenges those perspectives and and in a sense it liberates liberates ourselves um, and future generations. Hopefully, it's if it's a contribution to the conversation, so in the continuum of things. So. Absolutely, um, and I mean I'm sure that it is, and I I think. Um, when you're when you're an artist and you're coming from you know what we call a marginalized background I feel like it's so important to sort of interact with those stereotypes and think through um where they're coming from and whether or not you're trying to sort of like fight them and what that means um because it's all just exercises of people putting things on you and and like assigning value to you and your work in your community again um which is like not what and, we and, and yeah and there's also a, a a an instance and space for saying like, all right, it's not realizing it's not solely our role to teach everyone uh, to catch them up to um, where we're at in these conversations, uh, which I also think is why a lot of times we're able to exist. 10 years ahead of institutions, 10 years ahead of some of these spaces because we don't get hung up and or don't have to get hung up in, in trying to catch everybody up to, the, to this. And, and again, that I think has led through demonstrating and, um, and of course, we, uh, continually remaining fearless in a sense. So, but. Absolutely. Um, well, I kind of, that kind of leads perfectly into the question I wanted to ask you about um, art and activism, um, especially, mm. I think, um, for you being an Indigenous artist, um, for me, as a, I'm a queer writer of color, um, I'm wondering about how you think about um, the role that art plays in activism, or vice versa, the role that activism plays in art, um, protest, all of those sort of, um, those those links we definitely have i believe that there's responsibility that we uh, I feel like is um I, I like to try to um uphold in a sense of that that responsibility of the community and the responsibility of where we uh come from and responsibility to those struggles that have been um generationally 
passed on in a sense. So um, as an indigenous community member, we are still in multi-generational aspects of, of what that means, whether it's fighting for land rights or sovereignty of um, our legal systems or whether it's fighting for um, subsistence rights to feed our families and, and, mm -hmm. and connect to place in real um, important ways. Um, and that surfaces in so many different forms. So when we talk about, for example, the Whitney and candors and tear gas, the um, immediacy of how that reaches some of our communities and how it's felt institutionally is, is um, for me, you can't ignore it. And, and it's, um, it's connected to so many other historical acts of genocide, et cetera. So, and it's oftentimes these communities, whether it's Ferguson, mm -hmm. whether it's to, like Mexico, to you want a border, whether it's Standing Rock. Um, I'll tell you where that tear gas didn't show up. That tear gas did not show up at these um, protests happening at city halls recently where people want to get haircuts and, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, there was that, they were armed very distinct communities were armed with firearms and signs demanding that they were tear guns. And there was no tear gas, there was no rubber bullets. Um, these, these, this, these are all tallying things of this spaces that we are in, you know, yeah. whether or not people point things that try to really see what it, what it is for, we see it, so I see it, but yeah. Well, and the really wild thing um, that I was just thinking about as you were saying that is that um, when we're looking at those protests that are happening right happening right now for people who want us to reopen um, the economy, yeah. like they're actually protesting for something that would be incredibly dangerous and would cost many people their lives, yeah. Um, yeah, as opposed certainly. to um, other protests protecting protecting water for everyone. Right. Everybody needs water. Right. right? Like so. So it's um, yeah. Yeah. It's met in two different realms. So. Um, just we for have, the sake we, we have, we, we, oh, I just real quick, though, we have, oh, yeah, uh, those responsibilities and we have agency and power amongst all this, um, artists do and, and, and thinkers and creators and, and we get to experience and share what those experiences are, um, in meaningful ways, I believe. So it's, you know, um, will you exercise that agency and that power? And I was wondering if just for the sake of context, you could um, talk us through a little bit the situation that happened with the Whitney, um, just in case people who watch this like don't know that story. Like I didn't know that story until I was looking you up. Yeah, sure. Uh, I can go over it really briefly. I think um, the our, our cultural institutions, um, are oftentimes, um, and, and I want to, our museums, et cetera, our universities, um, the histories and backgrounds of how, and even what land they're built on, um, how that land was acquired historically, even as, as um, there's a recent article, I don't have it off on my hand right now, but um, about universities and how they acquired the lands that they are built upon. Um, but these institutions have power and they have, um, they get to um, control or contribute how history is uh, um, of our communities and societies are experienced and written about and what's preserved and what's, you know, um, how, our communities work framed even. Oftentimes our indigenous communities are excluded from those spaces, like statistically, whether it's um, who gets to show in those spaces, whether it's staff, what side of the staff they're on, are they, are they service staff, are they curatorial or directors in those spaces? Uh, um, what's acquired in those uh, institutions? And then, of course, they're talking about funding. So funding of that was one of the board members was Candors, who profited 
and it continues to steal off of um, basically off of pain and violence and a lot of that violence is experienced in our communities. Um, not only was, is it through tear gas, but also later uh, forensic architecture uh, research discovered that their work was also with Palestine, Palestine and um, linked to arm uh, ammunition manufacturing that um, is was used for war crimes on communities. So, um, wow, real messy, messy, uh, and gross things, you know. To um, <clears throat> but our experience in our community, there was a performance artist in the Whitney that was in Puerto Rico during those recent uh, protests, um, and was um, in a crowd that was, you know, they're peacefully protesting. It was was met with candorous tear gas during that during the Whitney. What was up? So, um, wow. So it was problematic to go into the space initially knowing this, and we, you know, a lot of us were aware that this was a conversation. And the problem there's there's a lot of issues in this for me, and I've uh, realized that at the the go and. Uh, um, you know, we uh, another responsibility that I felt was necessary was to show up because we historically don't have voices in those spaces at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so to show up gave gave us a little bit of access to to uh, that. And there, there, the uh, seventy some or I don't remember fifty something artists. And, Bunch of staff signed a letter, reversed a letter to um, addressing this conversation issue, and you know that was the first. And while in while we have some platform within the institution trying to uh, generate and facilitate like some action, and nothing happened, and it was met with nothing. So uh, myself and four other artists wrote uh, and signed a letter that. Um, was addressing their inaction and their issue with that and uh, asked to pull our work. Uh, form, former artists followed uh, with support and um, Candor's a week later resigned from his, from his position. So, but that still doesn't resolve things in a sense. You know, was major in a um, sense that we guided uh, with action um, and assisted a larger protest you know there was there was it wasn't just the artists there was a lot of other communities out there leading this conversation and um, facilitating action so it was definitely solidarity and putting something that uh, I mean yeah, we 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 put a lot on the line that some people felt like they weren't in positions to, and that's fine too. Not everybody has. Um, there's different levels of how people are willing to engage or can or can't engage. So it's not meant to be divisive in any sense. So. Right. That's true. I think that's such um such a wild story, and it's really fascinating and. Um, it's interesting because on the one hand, like reading, reading that and hearing about it, I think like, oh, that was really successful because um, ultimately Kanders resigned his position. Um, but then on the other hand, you sort of feel like, um, like, okay, so he resigned, but does that yeah, really... More... Okay, I'm back. Um... Sorry, I caught, I, I, you might have to refresh me at the end of that question there. Uh... Oh no worries. I um I'll I'll repeat I'll repeat it. Um so I um wanted to give our potential viewers a little bit of context and so in yesterday's conversation we chatted a little bit about the situation when you were having work um featured in the Whitney Biennial and um it came out that a board member at the Whitney had been profiting off of tear gas. And so after some months of correspondence between you and a number of other artists um, at the Whitney, um, it seemed like it wasn't going anywhere. And so you all 
said you would remove your work from the show. And then soon after that, the board member resigned and you made the decision to keep your work in the show. Um, and, you know, beyond that specific scenario, I'm curious about, um, or beyond that scenario, what I think is really interesting is that it's clear that you understand and lots of artists understand that there are so many things that go into making an institution an institution, especially when it's a powerful one. And so um, I'm thinking about how artists can use their voice when they're confronted with situations like these or other problematic situations with the institutions that might feature them or show their work. Um, I'm curious about advice you might have for artists facing situations like that. Um, I'm curious about um, if you have more thoughts on how institutions can um, make sure that they're sort of walking, they're not just talking the talk, but that they're walking the walk, right? So if they're showing artists from marginalized communities, how are they potentially um, working to support those communities and not taking part in things that might harm those communities? Um, that I'm just think, I'm thinking about that kind of consistency throughout. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, that was a particular example, I think, where a lot of effort came to, um, uh, you know, a boiling point of sorts, I suppose, but, and, and we were in a position to lead through demonstration of, um, you know, putting our, our, um, putting our work and ourselves into a position of um, trying to bring uh, change to something that at times seems like, you know, impossible to access or, um, and um, I think that's also a good example of what to ask of these institutions that need to uh, implement change is to demonstrate um, through demonstrate through action. It has to be like you have to. How many panels can you sit on, uh, or how many panels can like token individuals sit on in these spaces where it's met with no real um, no real action of hiring uh, into this places no real action of um follow through with statistics that sh prove that it's change that's in, in, in implemented um yeah and and so i think that that is that's a good example of initiation initiating that um with or without support um obviously in that instance um I was I was personally completely uncertain of what would happen in that I was prepared to uh, like understand that maybe my uh, participation would have an asterisk historically next to it or maybe it still does I have no idea but or maybe it would have uh, <laughs> maybe be removed right you know right um, and and that was based on um, you know my mine and others decisions to to um initiate response i suppose so um yeah we ha but we have we we have agency and artists do and we 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 also have and um we're also connected deeply to roots of community and we're able to um be in those spaces and connect to these spaces in in real ways um, that are oftentimes free from uh, institutional barriers, et cetera. Absolutely. I think um, it's important to remember that we have agency because it can be really hard when you feel like you're in a position to either sort of bite the hand that feeds you or just sort of lay down and, and, and be complicit. And that can be yeah. a really difficult decision for artists. Um, so I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day yesterday and today to do these conversations. And before we sign off really quick, I want to um, give you the chance to, to promote like your website, any social media or any other way that people might be able to access your work um, oh, nice. to, yeah. to promote you. Yeah. Um, 
I guess I stay fairly active on Instagram at, at Nicholas Glennon. Uh, try to post my projects and uh, so you can find me there, of course. And then um, for other related art related news, my website's www.galan.in. So um, yeah, you could also check for upcoming shows and projects there. Amazing. Thank you. We, I'll, yeah. I'll make sure that we put that into, um, these are going to go up on YouTube, so I'll make sure that we put them, put um, those in the description as well. Oh, so, great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Thanks a lot. No problem. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this and um, good luck. Good luck with everything. Yeah, yeah you too.